Um, last, uh, the last series I did, which wasn't last month, it was the month before, so let's see, we're in April, so it would have been uh, February. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, that when we live with purpose, what we do matters. We talked about how my job isn't just my job, it's a means for me to glorify God. Um, we talked about um, that we do, uh, li- when we do things, do things on purpose, for purpose. Uh, we talked about really a lot of different things like that, and I want to build on those things we were talking about in that, in that series. Um, if you weren't there, don't worry too much about it. I've pretty much just summarized every, the, main, the main points of it all. Um, now, the mission of this church is to build bridges in the community and to bring people to God. Now, that, okay, all right, but then sometimes we say, okay, well, but what does that actually mean? Like, what does that translate to? What, what? Like, I got that part memorized, so what do I do with it? And, you know, okay, so I know what the mission of our church is, but how do I fit in? What, what, what do I do? What am I doing? Like, <laughs> is there something that I can, I can do? And that's kind of what uh, this, this month we're going to be talking about. What can I do? Um, and, you know, obviously we all have different, we all have different uh, you know, strong suits and whatnot. So what can you do to make a difference? Uh, I was reading a book by Bruce Waltke called Finding the Will of God, A Pagan Notion. And he says this, society values wealth over character. That's true. Our society, they, they, they tend to cater to wealth over character. And so then you think about different cults that have risen up over the past couple of years, and one of them, like the name it and claim it one, you know, oh, it, it's real popular on, on TV. Hey, you know, you just pray a certain way, you just do this a certain way, you're going to get financial blessing to overabundance, taking the gospel of peace and making it the gospel of wealth and of self-profit. And um, um, it's like I was watching this video by um, uh, Bill Mounts. If you don't know who he is, he's one of the leading uh, Greek uh, scholars of today's age. And um, he was on the ESV committee for, I believe, it was 10 years. He, I believe he's still on the NIV committee. Um, but one thing he was talking about is he was talking about Romans 8.28, and he says, all things work together um, for the good. And he said, that's just wrong. The Greeks shouldn't read like that. The King James started the error, and the other translations have just gone away with it. And he said, he said this is way better. We know that God works all things <laughs> for the good. And then he says, and then he makes this very important little point. He says, so what's good? See, we think good is financial blessings. Why? Because we as a culture favor prosperity and wealth over character. It doesn't matter what my character is like so long as Jesus somehow profits me. And so that's what we've turned Romans 8.28 in. All things work together for my good, for my prosperity and, and, and blessings. And uh, I would add to Bruce, Bruce Waltke's statement that society values wealth over character by saying this, life isn't so much about the do-do list or earning worth as being someone of character. Life isn't so much about what you do, it's more about who you are. That's another way of saying it. Basically, you as a person are going to be overly concerned with what's my purpose, singular, the one thing that I'm going to do, my, my Gideon moment. Well, if you look at, for instance, the Apostle Paul, he didn't really have a one thing, did he? He had kind of a lot of different things. And God led him here and led him here, and he seized opportunity, and some things God didn't tell him to do, and he did it anyways. I don't remember him ever saying that God said, hey, write the book of Galatians. And yet he wrote the book of Galatians. And look, it's in our Bible. So how about that? You see what I mean? There, there's, a lot of things, there's a lot of things that we just kind of, I think, have a misunderstanding about. So... W- what is it that you can do? Well, the first thing you can do, and we'll add to this list as we go throughout the month, but the first thing you can do is be willing. God is looking for someone who's willing. Well, yeah, but how is that helping me, you know, with the mission of the church or bringing people to God? And, and, and Well, hold on now. That actually is a lot of it. That's actually a good chunk of it. Be willing. See, often our perception of God is based more on our own experiences than what the Bible actually says. And I'll give you a couple examples, and I hope you'll kind of see what I'm saying. First off, maybe you had a cruel father, and so you see God as a cruel father. Maybe you had a demanding boss, and so maybe you see God as a demanding boss. Maybe you had a nagging spouse, and so you see God more as a nagging spouse. You can't ever do anything right. They're always standing over your shoulder 
that kind of thing. Maybe you had an incompetent employee if you were ever a boss yourself. And so you see God is someone who kind of needs to be coaxed. You know what I mean? Like, God, look, I have this plan. This is my to-do list. we got to get motion on this. You know, I, I've prayed. Why haven't you answered it? Do it. See what I mean? Kind of treating him like he's an incompetent employee. Maybe you had a manipulating family member, and so you think that God is manipulating you. See what I mean? Oh, God's just trying to jerk me into doing something that I don't want to do. The truth is that life really does have a huge impact on how we see God. And if we don't ever challenge those ideas, we'll continue having them. And before you say, well, I certainly have the correct view of God, let me just stop you right there. The Bible actually says that no one has perfect understanding of God. It actually says it like this, who knows the mind of God? So if you think you have God figured out, figured out back up, you don't. <laughs> let me just stop you right there, you, you, you don't. He, his ways and his thoughts are up here. Yours aren't even on this scale, okay? So just, so just to put things in perspective, he's not like a really powerful human. He's God. He's completely else. He's not made out of physical matter like we are. Does that kind of make sense? He's outside of time. Imagine the enorm enormity of that, and you have a slight glimpse into what God is. See, but the thing is, good for us, there's this philosophical kind of debate. And the idea is this. I'll run it by you real quick because philosophy tends to make people go to sleep, and I really don't want you to go to sleep. Um, this guy looking at shadows on, on the wall uh, from, a, from a fire, and you can't really see what those things are. And the argument has been made that the same is true of God. I mean, you might see glimpses or shadows of him, but you can't really know who he is. Well, I have good news because everything that God wants us to know about him is in the Bible. We will likely go through all of eternity never knowing God fully, always learning for all of eternity. Why? Because God isn't like us. If you're a literature major, you would say he's not a one-dimensional character. <laughs> he's got a lot of depth and complexity to him. And whereas us, you can figure a person out pretty well in maybe a couple of hours, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months or a couple of years, but not so much with God. God is, is, is complete other. So, yes, even you might have a slight misunderstanding of who God is. Remember to approach this with humility before we get too deep into this. Matthew 25, 14 20 through 27. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Ah. Well, that was an interesting little statement. Did you catch that? Each according to his own ability. So you mean to tell me that this, that this, this boss didn't hold one up to the standard of another? Ah, very important point there. See, there's a lot of people who have these keys of success, right? They'll ha they have these seminars. This is how you change your life, how you revitalize your, and they do it with leaders too, right? This is how you become the world's best leader, you know, all these, you know, the next big thing to help you figure out all your slumps and everything. And they, they have this one-size-fits-all solution. This is what you need to do to have a real encounter with God. Go through these five steps. It's like, wow, that was very helpful. So then you get all pumped up at the conference, you go home, and two days later, you're in a slump again. Why? Because the one-size-fits-all didn't really work there, did it? So let's run over that again. Each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. The one who had received the five talents immediately went out and did business with them and earned five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents earned two more. It doesn't say immediately went out, but he did earn two more. So that's kind of might be important. Um, in Greek, so I didn't double check this is the problem. In Greek, sometimes it'll carry over the thought from a previous sentence. So that it might be an implied that he went out immediately. I didn't check it, I, and I do apologize for that. Um, but he uh, who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, well, that's one way to make sure that nothing happens to it, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I will say this. Oftentimes, we want to find God's will, right? We want... God to tell us exactly what to do in every situation so that there's no risk in life. So I don't have to risk anything. I don't ever have to lose anything. I can always just plow forward into victory after victory, but God doesn't do that, does he? A little bit troubling. And I think that uh, maybe this might be hinting to that, too. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, 
You entrusted five talents to me. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. Now, notice that. Faithful with a few things, okay? That's the key word I want you to remember. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. Again, you were faithful with a few things. Okay, that's really important, and we'll come back to that in just a second. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. Now, here we get to the last guy. Okay, this is like the, um, you know, the, 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 the dwarves. This is, this is, what's his name? Doofus or Goofy or what the heck is his name? Dopey. This is Dopey, you know. All right, you know. Now the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Well, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed, and I was afraid. So I went away and hid your talent from the ground. See, you still have what is yours. Huh. But as, you know, I bet that the Master could have probably just dug the hole and thrown it in there himself if that's what he wanted. <laughs> I don't know, I, I could be wrong here, but I don't think you have to have a slave just to dig a hole and put something in it, I don't know, maybe, whatever. But his master answered and said to him, you worthless, lazy slave, did you know that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but first off, let's just point out a few things. First off, the last man didn't try and lose. Did do you get that? It's not that he tried to make an investment and lost. There's a lot of times in ministry where you think, I did so much, I worked so much, and I have nothing to show for it. That's not this guy. Because even when you feel like you haven't made anything, God has a way of just making it something come of it eventually somewhere down the road, even where it seems like nothing came of it. I don't know how that works, but that's kind of God's own business. The thing is, though, that the last man, he didn't try and lose. He simply didn't try at all. Oh, well, I'm scared to do ministry because what if I mess up? That's not the issue. The issue is he didn't even try. You will not do things perfectly. That's all right. See, Jesus praised the other two. Now get this. He did not praise them for perfection. He praised them for faithfulness to the task, sticking with it. That's it. Go back and read it. I'll do it for you. You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. That's the only thing he says. He does not say this. You did as much as you could. He, maybe they could have made more. Maybe they could have made less. I don't know. I'm, I'm not there, okay? I'm not their manager, but I bet you I could get one. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking, just joking. <laughs> uh, a little joke. I, anyways, moving on. See, Jesus praised the other two for their faithfulness, faithfulness to the task, not their perfection in the task. God is not a taskmaster. He doesn't sit over people's backs just whipping them. Not good enough. Not good enough. The two tried, the one didn't. That simple. He didn't say that you did the best. Well, that's another conversation, I guess. He didn't say that they were perfect. He said that they were faithful in it. And here's another little important point. He left them to it. You don't see God micromanaging or demanding it was done a certain way. Have you ever been in charge of a project and you just go, uh, no, don't do it that way? You know what I mean? It just kind of gets under your skin because they're not doing it the way that you want it done. This master didn't do that. He didn't stand over their backs and say, okay, all right, uh-huh, yep, uh, that's wrong. Do that like this, and yep, but he didn't micromanage. See, this is kind of important because we are control freaks, and we think, and then God doesn't work like that. So maybe they could have made more. Maybe the first two were just as scared as the last one was because the last one said he was afraid. Maybe the first two were too. He didn't say, hey, good job not being afraid. He said, hey, you are faithful to the task that I asked you to do. Ta-da! And it was according to their ability, so we all know it was something that they could have done. See, sometimes we do this. God, why do you expect so much of me when you know I can't do it? 
God hasn't called everybody to be a pastor. He hasn't called everybody to be a worship leader. He hasn't called everybody to be an author. He hasn't called that. See what I mean? There's a lot of things that, but if God called you to do something, then you do that faithfully. Even if you don't do it well, do it faithfully. He also didn't compare what the one had done with what the other one had done. Did, did you notice here he doesn't say, you did better than this other guy? He didn't, he didn't say, that guy did better than you. He did not compare them. It was very simple like this. You yourself, for your part, have been faithful in this thing. I told you to do this. You were faithful with it. It was a very simple, either you are faithful or you are not faithful. He also didn't ask for the completed to-do list. Show me all the things you've done to prove your worth. It wasn't about that. He told them, excuse me, he told them to do something. They either did it or didn't do it. See, we make life as, as, as dull as, as, as we can. I mean, for those men in the, in the room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We like things to just be low maintenance. Do you know why men don't really contribute that much in a marriage? Because we like to just keep things status quo. <laughs> we, we already did the wooing you part. So you know that we love you. Deal with it, man. Jeez, what do you want us to do? Tell you every single day that you look pretty? Come on. We have the, we, men, like, uh, m men like machines. Men love machines. They build it. They start it. They leave it. That's how men like to work. Women, on the other hand, that's not, no, no, no. Women like things like gardening because they like to sit over it constantly and poking it and messing with it and yeah, just leave it alone, you know? And men and women, they don't think the same on stuff. They just don't get each other a lot of times. Women like to micromanage. They like to poke the bear. Men are just like, eh, whatever. You know, you notice how it usually things happen with, with, with fights in the house. The man's like, ah, whatever, and he leaves in a huff. The wife sits there and cries, and then when they get home, she hasn't dropped it yet. The guy has already moved on to, like, three other, con other ideas, and he gets home. He even forgot that there was a fight, and he walks, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And she's like, you just don't care about me. And he's like, oh, no, the machine's broken. How can I get this machine to start again so I can leave it alone again? See, men think of how quickly can I reach a resolution so I can leave it alone. It's a wonder how anybody ever gets married. I tell you what. <laughs> and there are some things that stop us from being willing. The first thing that we say is, I'm, I'm just not good enough. I, I'm not good enough. And I have to flip back through because I flipped back. You drove me to it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 28, 23, 29 says, And the insignificant things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so he may nullify the things that are, so that no human may boast before God. Well, I'm just not good enough. Well, good. If you're not good enough, that means God can definitely use you. Great to hear. I'm glad that you have come to realize <laughs> where you're at. Uh, or take 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. This is the single worst thing about the name it and claim it doctrine. Because w when you go into prayer and you say, I decree this, I command this, here's the problem, is that the power of Christ can't dwell where I have dominion. When it's all about me, that means it can't be about Christ. That's the big problem. I have dominion in that situation. It's all about me. There's actually, nowadays there's a lot of heresies going on. Going on. Basically the idea of them is pride. Um, there is one that, that we were talking about a couple weeks ago, I guess. It's called uh, Dominion dominion theology or something like that. The basic idea of this is uh, Christians um, are called to basically have dominion over everything. I mean, they twist the Bible this way and that to get it to say that, too. We're supposed to take over the government, and we're supposed to take over everything, and the finances, and the... Well, it, it's basically a new world order, but with Christian instead of with the Antichrist. It's, it's, it's kind of dark and creepy, but anyways, you know, there's just creepy things to get into, but see, the problem there is it makes it all about us. 
when you go to, when you go into prayers and it's all name and acclaim and that, it's all about us. The the power of Christ can't possibly sh- be shown because it's no longer your weakness and dependence on God. It's your greatness and His dependence on you because you are the hand of God. You know, and, it's, and how the Holy Spirit makes it where you are greater than Jesus, and it it warps it. It twists the gospel. It's no longer that simple message of salvation through Jesus. It's something completely other. But some people go to the other extreme. I'm too good. I'm too holy. I'm too righteous for that or for them. Sometimes it's a group of people or an activity. I won't be reduced to that activity. I won't impact those people. And, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't finish reading the verse. I, I am sorry for that. Let's, go, let's read that. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So he mentions a lot of different things there. Things that people do to you. Things that you just feel. Things that you deal with when you go through a situation that doesn't really work out that great. But So I'm not good enough. But then the, then the other thing that I was just about to start talking about is I'm too good. I'm too holy. I'm too righteous for that or for them. Sometimes after we've been saved for so long, we start thinking that I am just, I got it all together. And then we start doing things and sinning and, and, and doing all kinds of stupid stuff. And it's okay because once saved, always saved. So I can do all kinds of stupid stuff. Okay. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, not St. Corinthians. Proverbs 16 and 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Or take Isaiah 2, 11, The proud look of humanity will be brought low and the arrogance of people will be humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day. God isn't a God that shares glory. He, God's not a God that shares glory. It's not about me and him. It's about him. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Oh, ouch. Man, that one really hurts. And there's other related issues with this. One of them is not wanting to serve those kinds of people. And everybody has their type of person that they don't want to serve. Maybe it's rich people. Maybe it's poor people. Maybe it's a certain ethnic group. Everybody, ha- Maybe it's a certain age range. Everybody has that one group that they have a hard time um, reaching out to. Maybe you're just upset that things aren't your way, going your way. Well, if I can't have things my way, I'm not going to help at all. Well, okay. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also has forgiven you. People are going to annoy you. I don't know why more, more Christians don't realize this. We get in church and, and we start thinking that everything's going to be a rose garden and, I mean, there aren't going to be any problems. and er- no, Everybody's always going to think like me and I'm never going to get my feelings hurt. Well, I mean, that's an idea. It's certainly an idea. Do you realize that you have offended and hurt people before? No. Okay, all right. So do you think that maybe you also might get offended? And hurt by people? Okay, all right. All right. So, then somewhere along the, this we say, look, I, I, I want to be willing. Really, I do. But what if, God has call, what if God calls me to do something that I don't want to do? Now, I'm going to tell you a story. But first, let's read this verse in Matthew 16, uh, 24 through 27. So, verses, sorry, plural. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. God, I don't want to get stuck in this. Fill in the blank. Whatever that thing is that you don't want God to ever have you do. What will, I'm sorry, I missed it. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. See, it's not about revolving your life around your pleasure your dream job, what you want in every, in every, in every, I don't know what I'm trying to say. In every situation, I'll just say it like that. Whatever I was trying to say, it's gone, man. It's just gone. After, after kid number two, I think, is when it left. For uh, one day in my 60s, I'll be lying on my bed, and I'll wake up in the middle and say, oh, that's what I was saying. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life, for my sake, will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? 
For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every person according to his deeds. And uh, before I go to the story, did you like how when I used my 60-man-year-old voice, it was really old, like maybe a 90-year-old man? <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I had my whole life planned out. I had it all figured out. And we're talking about what if God calls you to do something that you don't want to do. So this is my story that has to talk about that. When I was a kid, I had everything planned out. Uh, there was a certain place I wanted to live. There was a certain job I wanted to have. There was a certain girl I wanted to marry. I had it all figured out. And, uh, well, now, they say hindsight is 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 twenty twenty. but if, is there... Is there a better than 2020? Is there like absolute true perfection? That. Okay, better than 2020 is what I would say. Because here's the thing. Had I gotten with that girl, oh my goodness, my life would have been miserable. Not only because of her. Oh my goodness. Ooh. <laughs> Dodged a bullet there. <laughs> but then also the mother-in-law. Oh man. Oh man. Man. <sighs> Oh, my goodness. Missed it by that much. <laughs> oh, man. And you know what the thing is? It wouldn't have just hurt me. My kids would have had to live with that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But my parents would have had to live with that. Now, Dad's going to go home tonight and give, like, I don't know, the, the fattened calf and a, and a burnt offering to God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It didn't work out. See, as it is, he got a daughter-in-law that can cook. I mean, is there anything better than that? Uh, but anyway, so my life would have been miserable if I had gotten with that girl. And it turns out that I ended up marrying the woman that I actually wanted without knowing it. See, when I first got married, I, I'm convinced that most people who get married, don't actually, they are not really in love. They might have feelings or something like that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. Uh, and I think that they think that they really are in love. Really, I do. But after being married, you know, it's 10 years this, this, this year. And that feels kind of cool. Uh, it makes me feel old. Um, I'm getting there. <laughs> I used to have a bassist named Jimmy Lee. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Uh <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Lost my train of thought on that one. Um. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but people get married, and they think that they, they're in love. And I'm convinced that you can't really say that you love your wife until you've been married for over five years, minimum. And the reason why I think that is because men do this thing. We want the biggest and the best. And oftentimes, we'll get with a person just because we think that they're, they're the most attractive person. Or uh, it's not uncommon because of sex. So then the whole relationship is built on sex. Well, I hate to be the one to rip off that band-aid, but you know that everybody gets old and ugly? Don't marry someone for sex. <laughs> marry them for a character. Because I can tell you, tell you what, long past the sex is gone, long past the looks are gone, the character stays. Y you got to prioritize crap like that when you're getting married. Anyway, so I'm convinced that, that most of the time when people get married, they don't really do it for love. They do it maybe for feelings or maybe insecurity. I don't want to be alone, so I want to get married. You know, and this person's really attractive, so let's just do that. You know what I mean? And so I, I, I'm, I'm going to say that looking back now, how much I love Gracie now, it seems like I didn't love her at all when we got married because of how much that love has grown. I don't know, really. I can't go back in time. You know what I mean? And uh, she said something to me the other day, and I said, Gracie, I don't think you realize how dependent I am on you. Like, what, what, what would I do if you weren't here? I'd turn, and I'd be like, hey, Gracie. And I'd be like, oh, Gracie's not here, right? Well, what would I do? Goodness sakes. Anyways, if I ever want to be not happy, I'll get a divorce. <laughs> I'll get, find the room on myself. <laughs> I'll be like, Gracie, I'm still waiting for you to take off my shoes. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. That's a joke. That's a joke. Anyways, my point being, I had this all figured out, and there was this girl that I was going to get with. I didn't get with her. turned out to be a blessing. Um, there was a, the job that I wanted. It, I would have been in training for that job until about 2019, maybe this year. It would have taken me that long to get the qualifications for the job. 
And now get this, with the different things that have happened with the pandemic, I would have lost my job. As it is, I'm here in an established job, and I have more security. Now, see, I didn't plan that. I didn't want that. <laughs> and yet it worked out. See, God's providence isn't really you enjoy it at the time. <laughs> and I think that's the hard part. So after all those years of working to climb the ladder, I would have lost it anyways. And the place that I wanted to live, I hate it now. I went back and visited a couple years ago, and I went there, and I was like, this? Oh, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No. And I just turned around. I was like, okay, let's go home. It was fun seeing old haunts or whatever, but we're going home now. Um, I hate that place now. Whereas here, now let's, let's go here. I hated this place. I didn't want to live here at all. Here's the thing. I found a perfect way to relieve a lot of my depression and anxiety. Do you, want, do you want to know what it was? Biking. Do you know what down here is perfect for? Biking. Do you want to know what I've been saving for a bike for a long time? Do you know when I finally got the money was right before all the bikes sold out last year? You can't plan this stuff. I didn't know the bikes were going to sell out. What kind of a nonsense is that? Bike shops not having bikes? Come on. Yeah, I couldn't have planned for that. And then, you know, I hated the desert. But the more I live in the desert, the, the more the desert just kind of, it, it feels like me. You know what I mean? I, I, I see a lot of myself mirrored in the desert. The, the, the dryness, the barrenness, the, the times of just quiet. So oftentimes I'll just go out into the de desert and just sit there for a little bit and just, just listen. You know, and, and that's okay. I mean, the desert kind of just gives me that, that break that I need. If I lived in a city, which was where I wanted to live, I would have been miserable. All the noise and noise and noise. It's like the, the green guy, the Christmas movie, the green guy, the Grinch. It's like the Grinch. What their noise, 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 noise. I, it's like, I don't. Cities are overrated. And, you know, but it doesn't just stop there. So it happens, it just so happens that I'm in the right place at the right time. And it resulted in me being able to have all of my kids that I have. Um, if you don't know the story of that, I, I'm not going to share it, but suffice it to say that it just it just worked out. And if I had lived somewhere else, it wouldn't have worked out. Um, and then um, someone actually bought me a vehicle large enough to carry them on, and I spent nothing on it. Okay. Well, it keeps going. I own my own house. Actually, the second house that I bought, the first house, I was stuck with it. I couldn't sell it because they wasn't really making anything off of it renting, which is funny because all the renters were like, you're just in it for the money. I'm like, what money? Tell me when I find it. <laughs> but anyways, and uh, so then, you know, we just had this great opportunity to sell it, and it sold, and it was wonderful. Sold it for way more than I think it was worth, but they seemed happy with it. So I was like, okay. Uh, so I reinvested the money that I made out off of that, and uh, it, it all worked out. And uh, now, in hindsight, I can say this all the way God led me. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't how I wanted. It wasn't the time frame that I wanted. Get used to disappointments because of this. And I just pay attention to this, okay? Maybe your desires and maybe your expectations need to change. Maybe you're looking at it wrong. If I could go back and have things my way, what would have happened? Well, I wouldn't have had the people in my life that matter the most to me. Yes, I have lost a lot. I've been betrayed. But here's the thing about that. Love has risks. With every love is the risk of loss. You get married, you don't know if your wife will leave you or die or anything else, right? You can't guarantee what tomorrow will bring. You have kids. You don't know that your kids are going to be healthy. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. With every love, there is the risk of loss. You can't live guarded. It's no way to live anyways. Hebrews 10.38 says this, But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. God, well, let's go to this next thought really quick. God won't call us to do some things. There, there's some things that I've heard along the way, and I want to share some of them with you. That people, I've also oftentimes heard from, you know, from people, and I, it's not really founded on the Bible, it's just founded on themselves. Like, one thing is to complain. One person I was talking to was convinced that God 
had them as a voice of complaint so that people could hear um, how they were doing things wrong. God won't call you to a place of complaint. Next thing, out here in Otero County, people always do this. They go and start their own little home Bible study group things. There's no authority structure. It's apart from the church. It's just a place where you validate your own opinions. And here's the problem that, that happens. It's from people who don't have a problem with authority, and all they do is get around and talk about politics, and they're not reaching people. So it's all around just a, a something bad that happens. You don't know how many times since I've moved here. This is, in Texas, this isn't really a thing. They, they have their own issues in Texas. I'm not, I'm not glorifying Texas. Oh, no. You couldn't pay me to live in Texas. I, I, no, I, I'll stay here. Thank you. No, just no. Uh, but I've heard out, out here, very common. Well, I feel like God's calling me to not go to church. So what do you, what do, you do? Well, I just sit at home and read the Bible. Okay, all right. When's the last time, you know, God's really spoken to you and you've seen something new? Well, well, not too much lately, but I read these books that help me. Okay, how do you know those books are on the, on the money? I mean, the church was really made to be together. <laughs> so, I mean, that's not really something. That, and here's another one just blew me, blew me away. This, this guy, um, God wanted him to get with this girl who was married. A lot of these issues could be resolved by just reading your Bible. The Bible says in, in Corinthians not to complain like Israel did, uh, not going to church. Hebrews says uh, we shouldn't forsake gathering together but meet all the more. Uh, the thing about, you know, the, the woman, it says not to commit adultery. It says not to divorce. It's, well, let's go down the list of all the reasons that was wrong. <laughs> uh, the next thing, support false teachers. Hey, I, I don't have money to pay rent, but I'm going to send a check to send this guy on the, the televangelist. Okay. What God doesn't call us to hate our enemies. Oh, those Democrats, they're so stupid. Oh, those homosexuals, they're so stupid. God doesn't call us to hate our enemies. <laughs> if those are your enemies. I'm not saying Democrats and homosexuals are inherently enemies of the church. I'm not saying that. <laughs> so if, if there are any homosexuals or Democrats, did not mean that, okay? Um, anyways, uh, whoever your enemy is or your person who you despise, whatever, God hasn't called us to have bad attitudes. Well, it's okay for me to gripe and complain because, well, I'm faithful in my, in my way, the thing that I do. Well, okay, but I mean, I don't think that God wants you to complain about it. Did you know that it's better to just not be faithful to something than to sit around God and complain about it while you're doing it? Really, it is, because it spreads to other people, and God doesn't enjoy complaining. It's just kind of like a foul reek to him. You know what I mean? Um, I was doing this one thing that I really didn't like doing, and I was complaining about it every single week. It was always something that just really bothered me. And, uh, well, God had a couple things to say about that. <laughs> See, sometimes we think that we're, that we're real spiritual. I if you think that you're real, real spiritual, I'm not going to argue with you. Just this very simple statement, check your attitude. If you think you're real spiritual, check your attitude. Sometimes you're going to think that God told you something you maybe heard it wrong. How do you know when God speaks to you? There, there's a tier system. This first stage, what does the Bible say? The second stage, you should be developing a heart for God where God can speak to your conscience. The third stage, you should be seeking wise counsel. Go in, go in, if you're not as sure about a decision that you're making, go and ask somebody who's spiritually mature. And then after that are the other things. The things like, does it make sense? Is God's providence behind it? Those things. So we kind of get things mixed up, and we go by feelings instead of what the Bible says. And it's just, that's not a good, those three stages right there will save you from most of your problems. Read the Bible, develop a heart for God, seek wise counsel. If Balaam would have done that in the book of Numbers, he wouldn't have been killed. Just a little side note there. Go read Numbers if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so here at this chur church, we do things with excellence. What, what does that mean, to do something with excellence? It means to be perfect in everything, right? No. All that doing something with excellence is, is this. I do something the best that I can do without complaining about it. That's, that's, that's it. The best that I can do. Did you know that I can do the best job that I can on building something, and it's not even going to be a fraction of what my dad could do? Did you know that my dad could do the best job that he could writing a song or playing the guitar, and it still wouldn't be even close to how good I can? The best you can do without complaining about it. Well, I don't like doing this. Well, 
how about you don't complain either way? And I have this exact same standard um, for my kids. When I tell my kids to do something, if it's something that they can't do well, that's okay. I don't, I don't get upset with them doing it not as good as me. I get upset when they don't try. And I say this, did you do the best that you could? And sometimes they'll say, no. Go back and do the best you can do. And then sometimes Michael will come to me in frustration. and will say, Dad, I did the best that I could. And I said, okay. That's all I asked for. It's all right. Calm down. It's okay. Well, it'll be okay. Because, you know, when you're working on a task that you're not good at and you just get more and more frustrated. You've been a kid before, right? Okay. <laughs> when, we, when we got here um, as pastors, nothing was built right. Oh, my goodness. Nothing was built right. Everybody who did anything had this, th- had this, I- I- this idea, I- I- this attitude. You're lucky I'm doing it at all. Well, goodness sakes, then don't do it. We've been spending the last 11, however many years, cleaning up those little messes because people didn't want to do it right the first time. And uh, there was somebody who was making fun of my dad for how perfect he had to get the basketball hoop outside. And I was just thinking, at least it's done right. <laughs> you don't have to tear it down in five years and redo it. That's a guarantee. And, uh, you know, when we do things here at this church, we do the best that we can, and we do it without complaining. We waited six years for that basketball hoop to be put up. We knew it wouldn't be perfect. We, we knew that if somebody else did it, it wouldn't necessarily be how we would have done it. We were okay with that. We were giving people time. We were giving people chances. And it, we, we, we came to grip with the fact that it wouldn't be exactly how we wanted. And we didn't demand that it was done our way. We were not going to, going to sit over their shoulders and, and nag them about how they should do it the whole time. Well, six years later, we decided, okay, well, that, you know, that was fun. I think if somebody was going to do it, they would have done it by now. So we just went out there and did it. Ricky, me, Dad, and Damien, we just wiped it out in like two, two or three days or something. You know, it was okay. We weren't complaining about it. None of us were complaining. We were all excited that it was getting done. We did the best that we could. Now, when we did it, it was perfectly level, not because a sixteenth of an inch really matters that much, but because that's the best that we could do. We could have gone out there and thrown it up and, and, and even quicker and, done a, and, done, and not done as good of a job, but that wouldn't have been the best that we could have done. We did the best that we could do out there. I'm proud of that basketball hoop. I didn't do much on it. Most of the work was done by my, my dad and Ricky and Damien. But with that being said, I'm still proud of it because we got it done, and it's done right. Our kids, when I'm dead, that thing will probably still be there. I mean, that thing's really firm in there. You go out there and check it out. See, we are building for the future, and we're doing things with excellence. But with that being said, I will say this. It's probably, be be- probably best if you find something that you're good at. Sometimes you see people volunteer for something that they're not good at. You should, you should probably stick with the jobs that you're, that you're good at, you know. Like, uh, well, I think I'll just go ahead and leave that there. See, there are three pastors here at this church. We could find something to change or complain about if we wanted to. Between the three of us, we could find something. We could start going to people's, like, classes and, hey, Gracie, what are you doing here? Hey, Melissa, what are you doing in here? We could find something to complain about. The thing is, though, we don't really want to because here's the thing. We do messy. We do imperfect here at this church as long as it was done with excellence. That's it. We don't demand perfection from people. We uh, We ask them to give it their best. What can you do? Then do that. There are some people who are doing things in this church where I'm sure we could find somebody more qualified. You you hear people saying this all the time. Am I really qualified to do that? You're doing it. (laughs) God asks for willingness, not perfection. We as pastors try to stay to that same standard. And here's a thing that really blew me away, and it's something that I've learned over the years. Complaint isn't excellence. Complaining is not excellence. You cannot possibly be doing the best job that you can do if you're complaining about it while you're doing it. Complaint isn't excellence. Here at this church, we do things with excellence. Hebrews 12, 1b through 2h, just the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus. 
It's not uncommon for grumbling to start something like this, though. Well, that's not how I would have done it. They should have done this. You don't know how many gossip groups have started just like this. Well, they should, the, John could, if John would have done this in the food pantry, it would have been a better idea, you know. Well, if Pastor would have done it this way, I think it would have worked out a little bit. See what I mean? And it starts so innocently, so innocently, and it just develops into this ugly monster. And we'll close out with looking at a few more examples here very quickly. Exodus 2, 11 through 14. Now, it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his fellow Hebrews and looked at their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his fellow Hebrews. I'm sorry, uh, beating, oh yeah, I said that right. So he looked this way and that, and we saw that there was no one around. He struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Now he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you uh, striking your companion? But he said, the, the, the person who he was talking to, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed that Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. And here's the thing. God called him later, 40 years later to be exact, um, to lead Israel, the Hebrews, out of slavery. And he fights God on it tooth and nail. But here's the thing. That was what he really wanted to do anyways. Isn't that funny? He was fighting God and fighting God, and that's what he really wanted to do anyways. See, the problem is, is that sometimes we, we want to hide in the desert and nurse our wounds. We want to sit and pout for 40 years. That's just, we want to hold on to that bitterness. Don't take my word for it. Take the person who, who, who had that really bad job and they're still complaining about it 10 years later. That person who had that really bad marriage and they're still complaining about their ex 12 years later. That person who still, who had that, I mean, go down that list. See what I mean? Of the bitterness that has been left over for years and years and years and years. We would rather sit in the desert and nurse our wounds than have to face up to the problem and change our attitude. It's easier that way. We, we, we get hurt, and we don't want to get hurt again. We say, mm, that's not fun. I'm not going to do that again. And the truth is that that's exactly what Moses wanted to do anyway. So he, God calls him out of the desert. And did you know that he made mistakes along the way? Did you know that God still called him? And he doesn't ever get to enter the promised land himself. But here's the thing. Had he not listened to God, he would have spent the next uh, 40 years in the desert anyways. So even though he missed out on the promised land, he was right back where he would have been anyways. The only difference is he, he, he started something important. God used him to do something that was a really big deal. And even if he never got to see the full fruition in the promised land, he still knew that God was going to do something with Joshua. He still knew what the direction was. God was still able to use him. See what I mean? Worse things have happened. Or take uh, Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus. This is a guy who's always shooting off his mouth, always had something dumb to say, and he did a bunch of dumb things too. Like God takes him on this experience up on the top of a mountain, and he sees you know Moses and, and Jesus and all this great stuff, and, and, and his answer to the solution is not like, wow, this is really cool. His answer is, hey, let's build a couple houses. Let's just not go down. We'll just stay up here. I think you missed the, po the point here, Peter. He denied Jesus at least three times. After Jesus was killed, he went off fishing. What a guy, right? <laughs> instead, of, instead of going and, and seeking after God, he goes fishing. And, you know, I understand it. It was probably a very traumatic time for them. Judas had just killed himself. They were like, we just, that dude was with us for a couple years, and now he's out there dead. That's, that's kind of, that dude that we were following for the past couple years, he's gone too. Kind of feels pointless. Kind of feels like we were working this whole time for nothing. See what I mean? So that I, I do definitely understand where Peter was going, coming from. But then, after Jesus ascends, and, and Peter is, you know, this big pillar of the church, he does this thing where he stops hanging around with the non-Jews. And Paul's like, what you doing, buddy? That's not right. And uh, Paul himself had to correct Peter for, for doing this. Peter made a lot of mistakes. 
it's not about perfection. It's about being willing. So in closing, we're just going to look at this. Look at this. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be uh, the cone of ministry. It's actually the pyramid of ministry because I didn't know how to make a cone in the word art thing. Uh, it's, it's a complicated process, okay? Computers have on buttons. They have mice and clicking and dragging, and it's a very complicated process. So here is the upside-down pyramid, which is supposed to be a cone, so call it the cone of ministry, but you're going to know in your head that it's... See, if I would have said, here's a cone of ministry, you all would have been laughing, and you would have said, that's not a cone, dummy, that's a pyramid. It's just upside down. So I, okay, all right. Here is the, uh, the pyramid of, of, minis- of ministry. See, God has great potential. It, let me say it differently. God can use us for a lot of different things. That is the top, the widest point. That's all the things that God wants to use us for. But there's things, that's our potential at the top, okay? But there's things that that we insert that narrow that cone, where it makes it where God can do less through us. And those those limits are are numerous. I'll I'll name a few of them. Uh, The first one that we see in nowadays is a very common one, politics. We make it where you cannot be a Christian unless you know how stupid the Democrats are. That's limiting our influence of, how, of who we can reach in life. Because it's all about, well, you don't agree with me on politics? That was the first qualifier. So we have narrowed our potential. Then maybe another one would be race. Maybe you're not too fond of a certain color of skin. Or maybe you're not too fond of a certain age group, a certain uh, wealth level. Uh, I knew one person who was convinced that if you had any amount of money whatsoever in your bank account, you were going to hell. So, I mean, whatever your hang-up is, that closes your potential. You will do dumb things. You won't handle everything perfectly. And others may do some things better than you. Be willing to be used by God anyways. Trusting in God is shown by what you do with your insecurity, your fear, and your failure, not the absence of them. See, we want God to take away all of our problems, all of our insecurities, our fears, what makes us us. We want him to take all that away so we can do uh, ministry better. But the truth is that if God took all those things, we wouldn't be dependent on him. And he wouldn't be able to use those in ministry. Have you ever, have you ever tried to minister to somebody who's grieving because their spouse just committed suicide? Have you ever struggled with suicide yourself? You see what I'm saying? You can't possibly reach a certain, a certain need that you have no idea what you're talking about. You can listen, but there's something that happens. It hits you different when you actually have gone through the thing. You know what I mean? And then there's this person, and, and it's just... I get it. Yeah, I, I know what that's like to be there. I know what it's like to feel that. I get it. Um, I, I grew up in a very uh, judgy church. They, they, had, they thought that they were doing everything right. And Let's just say that a person like me with depression and anxiety didn't really fit. <laughs> and, uh, well, it ended about how you thought it would. If you want to build bridges... If you want to build bridges in the community, and if you want to bring people to God, you have to be willing. Be willing to be used by God. And at, on the surface, that's easy to do. Oh, yeah, sure. But the real yes is that it's a lot harder. What happens when you're stuck doing something you don't really want to do for year after year after year, and you don't see much progress in it? Are you still willing? That changes things. It changes things a lot. Willingness is, your willingness is what builds bridges and brings people to God. That, that's, that's, the, that's the foundation to it all. If you're not willing to be used by God, then what's even the conversation? So rather than focusing on a to-do list of how to be the perfect Christian, be willing. 